Now, I'm really excited to introduce you to our next speakers. Um, first up, we have Sienna J. Brown, who is our own amazing Global Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, as an educator, expat, and entrepreneur, Sienna's mission is to teach driven women how to secure remote work opportunities aligned with their bigger missions and provide them with, with freedom and flexibility. Over the past six years, her focus has been working with companies and employees to create more diverse and inclusive workplaces that have a positive impact on their personal and professional lives. When Sienna is not working, she's at home on the Mediterranean coast, watering her plants, cooking a good meal, or engaging in meaningful conversations with friends. She's going to be joining in conversation with our own absolutely stunning Arushi Grover. Arushi joined us um, in a part-time role last year and has since uh, joined our team full-time as a summit coordinator. Um, I'm so happy to get to sit in on this talk with two amazing women that I'm so lucky to work with. Um, so I will turn the floor over to you. Take it away, ladies. Thank you once again, Meg, for the lovely introduction. I know Sienna and I are flattered right now. So diving right into it, Sienna, I am absolutely honored to be talking to you today. Let's begin by learning where you are located, because I know you're a traveler, and what, how did you start your journey at Power to Fly? Yeah, absolutely. So again, thanks, Mike, for the lovely introduction. Also, welcome to everyone who's watching, and thanks, Rishi. I'm really excited to pick up this conversation. So a little bit about me, like how Meg had shared in the intro. So I'm the Global Director of DEI here at Power to fly and it's interesting right so if we're going to think about my title global where am i located so i'm originally from new york if there's anyone from brooklyn watching hey but i have actually been living in spain for over seven years right and so when we think about the global aspect of it something that i really focus on is cross-cultural communication and understanding what is it like being in a place that isn't necessarily your home country what is it like communicating across languages, across cultures, different personality styles. And when we think about actually my journey to Power to Fly, it's so interesting because I know that in this conversation, we're talking about how to become a global director of DEI. But I also want us to think about if you're interested into transitioning into the world of DEI, if you're looking to make a mid-career pivot that's more aligned with who you are and the impact that you want to be making on the world, definitely be taking notes, right? So my journey to Power to Fly was actually very round circle now that I think about it. So Seppi, who has been a really good friend of mine over the years, actually introduced me to Power to Fly. I think it was maybe in the fall of 2019. And she was like, hey, there's this really great company. I think it could be a really good fit for you with the company that I have called Master Move Abroad to host a chat and learn. So if y'all don't know what chat and learns are, they're great daily events that we have where you can hear from different thought leaders, experts, career mentors, all of the great things. And so I actually gave a chat and learn at Power to Fly talking about working remotely. And it was during the pandemic, I think it was around March, et cetera. But when I was sharing about working remotely, I was also obviously talking about how do we do that as women? How do we do that as women of color? How do we really start to pave the way for what we know that we deserve and what we're worth, but doing it at companies that care? And so that led to full circle when there was an opportunity for a DEI position at Power to Fly, Lauren, our one of our head of marketing community, actually reached out and she was like, hey, there's a really great fit. I think you might be a good fit. And so for those of you who are listening, when I first joined Power to Fly, I came on as a consultant and trainer. And if we're looking at my resume, my LinkedIn, CV, whatever you use, it was my first official DEI position. Right. But in that short amount of time, been able to come in, make impact, lead the way, and then now be our global director of DEI. Right. And I think a little bit over a year's time. But what I really want to focus on with this story is that sometimes it just takes showing up and providing value for companies, for individuals and conversations and connections, but talking about what actually matters to you. Right. So talking about your mission, talking about your values, talking about the impact that you want to make because sometimes you don't necessarily know when the opportunity will come, but as long as you're able to communicate those things with clarity and confidence, that will help you start really being able to create your professional story and then also be able to make those mid-career pivots. 
Amazing. Wow. You just walked me through this entire journey. I <laughs> have the good fortune to work with Steffi and Lauren. So I feel really happy to be on their team. But, you know, you've said so much about a being a global lead director, right? So you were, you have, you were from New York, you went to Spain, obviously there's a lot of confusion, intercultural identity, there's so much to unpack in this whole thing. So, you know, maybe just like focusing a little bit on that. Did that sort of play a role into your marketing community uh, management experience, which you previously were in? Because DEI was, you know, this is your first role that you had here at Power to Fly. So what was it like to be that community member and then showcasing that as a global DEI strategist or consultant at, at the Power to Fly? Yeah, absolutely, Rushi. So that's a really great question. I think I want to talk to y'all for a second. Those of you who are watching, right? I always laugh because, again, if you were to look at my resume, my LinkedIn, et cetera, it would be like, what does this woman really do, right? I went from a long time ago doing fashion PR to travel experiences, to being in community management, to then going into business development. But something that I think is really important is how are you always connecting the dots, right? So although the titles might have been different or the fields might have been different, something that was always really important to me is like, how are we creating safe spaces for underrepresented individuals to feel like they belong. And how are we doing that? Building it from the ground up and focusing on community based on authenticity and actually showing up as active allies, right? And so outside of all of the work that I've done in like my nine to fives, I've also been building an online educational platform and community for women, specifically women of color who are looking to find remote work and move abroad, right? So again, DEI has always been a part of my DNA. This goes back to like, when I was a child and I was too white to fit in with the black community and then like the token black girl to fit in the white community. So it was always this identity shift of like, who am I, where do I belong? And it wasn't actually until after college that I was like, oh, I'm just starting to find other people who are kind of like me, finding that sense of community. So it's always been really strong or important for me to be able to say, how do we create that no matter where we go? And so when I think about marketing and community management, what I've done in the past, especially the global aspect, as I was growing my business, I really started speaking more. So giving TEDx talks, getting international press, et cetera, but talking about things like what does DEI look like in Europe, right? What does it look like in tech? How are we diversifying the world of remote work? You know, when I first started my company and also when I was working at the top, co one of the top co-living spaces in the world, it was like, my focus is on remote work, but I'm like, how do we get this to look a little bit different, right? How do we get to start bringing different people together from cultures, communities, et cetera, building community, but based on empathy and compassion and understanding. So again, I'm sharing all of that to say it's about, although you might have a lot of different things on your resume, whatnot, but it's like, how are you connecting the dots, right? How are you really being able to lean in and say like, what is my story? And then how can I communicate my story, my experience and my expertise? to kind of find in Spanish, you say like the ilo rojo, like the underlying thread that right. links it all together. Right, and then that in itself, uh, Sienna, goes back to our definition of DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? One has these diverse experiences and you know, coming back to your experience of, let's say being too quote unquote white for uh, the black community and being too black for the white community, that in itself is diversity in itself. So every one of us has this little diverse, sort of feelings and you know experiences that we bring forward it's just about how you like you mentioned connecting those dots and finding what is my diversity and how do I bring it forward because again like you mentioned diversity differs from country to country you know even differs on how people in, a, in, a, in an organization define diversity so there's so much to unpack from this whole DEI kind of um, you know word that we're using around so loosely these days right so I, I think diversity and equity co inclusion conversations, DEI conversations sort of sparked even more last year uh, after the incident of George Floyd, right? Unfortunately, that was when we started talking about DEI. So your experience, you know, working from a consultant with small startups to multinational companies, how has DEI evol evolved and how, what does DEI look like for different sort of companies in different sizes, different countries? So let's touch base a bit, a bit on that. Uh, I love this question, Arushi, and I think you leaned in on a really good point, right? I think DEI is something that just kind of like lives in this bubble for a lot of people instead of saying, hold on, 
Diversity is also diversity of thought, of personality. Are you introverted or extroverted? But making space for all different types of people in the room, right? But if we're thinking back to when the murder of George Floyd specifically and how that impacted not just companies, but also individuals, I think that it was the first time in a very long time in history where it was kind of like it's time to start taking action, right? So we were really seeing like now just companies not just like talking the talk and being champions, but actually having to do things about it, right? And so something that I really love is having a sense of intentionality versus how are we not just doing things to do them, but actually creating strategic plans and doing things like identifying what does diversity look like for our company? Who do we need to be bringing in? But also how are we creating an inclusive space so that when we do attract more individuals, we're creating a sentiment of belonging and inclusion, right? And I think that's something that's really interesting specifically for the companies that we work with. And I just want to highlight how amazing they are because they're thinking about what is the EI look like at a global level and how are we creating a strategy based on that? But also what are we doing in the day-to-day, -day, right? And I think something that's really easy for companies is being able to say, well, we launched all these things and now we have a task force and et cetera, but it's like, are the individuals that you're trying to support actually seeing impact and change? And so there's been a lot of studies by Harvard Business Review, a bunch of other companies out there that are saying, okay, well, companies have these initiatives, but the marginalized groups aren't actually seeing impact, right? And I think that's something that's really important for us to ask ourselves, if you are interested in becoming a DEI practitioner, getting into the field, but then also when we're working with companies to be able to make long-term change, to really be able to say, how are we making sure that we're having all voices being heard and not just sitting in a silo and having these conversations behind closed doors? So when I think about how it's evolved, again, number one, I think more than anything, talent wants to join companies where they're actually showing up, doing the work, being active allies, right? It's one of the top things that, that, sorry, that individuals are looking for when joining companies. And then I also see, again, like companies... And I'm just going to say like putting their money where their mouth is because it's not just about money and budget and all of that stuff, but it's actually saying, what are we doing on the day to day, right? How are we showing up for the most underrepresented person in the room and realizing that this is a marathon, not a sprint, right? So it's not about just trying to make quick change, but actually really being able to see the impact that we can have in the long term. Amazing. So the in the intention behind it. Why Why do you have DEI in your particular company, right? What is the main goal of having DEI in the company? Are you just doing it to take that box or are you actually doing it to get each and every employee of yours involved and make them feel like they are home? They can be their authentic selves, turn up, you know, especially in a remote environment. It's so important because that's that intrinsic motivation, right? The fact that we at Power to Fly, a remote first company, everyone shows up to work, things get done, right? That's because we feel that urge of, you know, I can be myself, I can have a conversation with you offline, the same conversation. So it's about, it's about companies giving people that space to express themselves, be the authentic self, and honestly just that's why people show up at the end of the day, right? Why would you want to go into a room where you're not valued? So yeah, I think that's a, that's a very important point. But you specifically as a global DEI director, you know, it's a very fancy, very big title. So how do you think about the underrepresented person in the room? What are the three steps or what are some action strategies that you think about when you think about DEI? Uh, I love that question. Okay, the first thing that I was going to say is proactive, active listening, right? One of my favorite books is Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. And it talks about sometimes the best way to learn is to take a step back and actually listen, right? And so sometimes we might not necessarily know who the most underrepresented person in the room is unless they feel like they have the psychological safety to share with us, right? So I really think number one, being able to practice, practice active listening and actually being able to create space to listen and not just react, right? Number two, be strategic with the questions that you ask and be strategic with communication, right? Because again, something that I think about is how often do you share an acronym without context, right? And then maybe people have to spend five minutes searching, ooh, what does this mean? I have no idea, but they don't really wanna ask, right? Or when you're sharing something internally, how are you making sure that you're using basic, easy to understand language? When it comes to meetings, something that I really love when we do on my team is like, we have connection moments at the start of every meeting. So we open up, not just diving into work, but saying like, 
what was your favorite holiday memory? Or do you prefer the beach or the mountains, whatever it is, but switching that up so you actually get to know the people that you have in the room so that you can say, okay, well, what are their personalities? What have I learned about them to then be able to see how it all fits in and really be able to support those who are underrepresented? And then the last thing that I was going to say is, sorry, I'm thinking about this because it's like, realize that it'll take time to work. And I say that because a lot of people want easy fixes of like, oh, but do I have time to send out a survey to ask my team, how do they like enjoying feedback and then come up with a strategic plan around it? Probably not. But is that important? And will it have your team want to work with you for much longer? Absolutely. Right. So those three things, let me see if I can recap going backwards is um, actually be willing to put in the work and think about the long term, actively listening and then creating connection moments. I might have missed one, but it's fine. If you were taking notes, then you got it written down. <laughs> well, the, the recording is available too within one week. So if anyone missed those notes too, we'll be sure to re release it. So you all can sit and take notes again, but very, very well put Sienna. It is important to take a step back, kind of evaluate what is it that the people in my organization need, or even, you know, if, what, it is, what is it that people in my community need? What is it people in my friend circle need, in my team need? We can go so micro and so macro with this entire phrase that's about you being a DEI consultant in your friend circle in the people around you in your neighborhood right so that small intentionality steps that we can take can have such a long a, you know drastic effect of it on an everyday basis that it's just important about stepping back being intentional and saying hey what is it that I can do to allow other people to feel welcome of, you know, they belong here and they need to be here. You know, I think that's very important. Similarly, I'm very inspired by our director of marketing, Lauren. She takes that moment out before every, you know, sprint meeting and saying, we'll have a random topic, sometimes about breakfast or food or something. And, you know, maybe we, our stomachs are growling at that point because you're so hungry, but we know each other much better. And maybe I won't have the opportunity to meet some of my coworkers because we work in a remote environment. But if we ever do get the chance, I know exactly what type of breakfast place to go to and what my coworkers enjoy, right? Because that's a sense of belonging I can create for my coworkers. Very well put, Sienna. Very, very well put. I can start going on this for a while. <laughs> I love it. I love it, Arushi. So, you know, this is a hot topic for today. If someone were to start their career in DEI, right? You had the good fortune to be at Power to Fly. Someone gave you the chance and opportunity, but not everyone has this opportunity. So how can people start their career journey in DEI? And what are some resources you sort of recommend, some books? I know someone in the audience had the same question. So how can we walk through this entire journey of starting as a DEI consultant or just an advocate? Yeah, I love this. The first thing that I would say is like when you're getting started and I'm going to continue going back to this, but like, what is your story, right? What makes you different? Because I think something that's so important specifically if you're looking to step into DEI is like now, especially in the past year and a half, like DEI positions, consultants is if we're looking at the trends on Google, it's probably gone up through the roof, right? And so, yes, you might be saying, oh, well, there's so much competition. How do I send out, et cetera? But I really do think the most important thing is what is your story? How are you bringing your personal experience, your professional experience into play and saying, okay, well, this is why and or how I can identify where we need to bridge the gap and how to do so, right? Because again, I think a lot of the time when it comes to DEI, it's that strategic thinking, it's that problem solving, it's that Arushi, like what we were saying, like creating safe spaces for people to actually open up, right? At the end of the day, my background is in psychology. So I think a lot about behavioral change and like we can talk about DEI all that we want, but like why should people care, right? And so your job is being able to say, number one, how are we getting people to care, right? And then number two, how are we creating those spaces? So number one, I would say, be clear on what your story is and how you're positioning your past personal and professional experience. Number two, the next thing that I would say is build connections, right? Build connections with other individuals in the field, build connections with companies that you really admire, right? Build connections. And Issa Rae always says like, how are we networking across, right? But start networking across and start being able to say, okay, well, when we focus on those long-term relationships, then when a job opportunity does come, you'll be ready, right? I'd also be remiss to not mention Power to Fly as a resource, right? If you're here, you're already three steps ahead of the game. 
because you can just head to our website or join the virtual job fair, whatever that might be, and be connected to companies that are looking for DEI specialists, practitioners, leaders, et cetera. So if you're here, check box. You can check that off and move to the next step, but really think about what is the story that you're sharing and how are you also doing the research to see what's missing in the market? And so that's a little bit high level tips, but if we're talking about some books, because I know that we also got a question in before from Nirupa about what are some of the books that you would recommend, et cetera. I was like, I'm sharing recommendations from this shelf right here. Um, a couple that I really love is one is called, so you want to talk about race. I'm not going to, you can Google them, et cetera. I'm not going to list the authors right now, but so if, oh my goodness. So you want to talk about race is a great book to read. I would also recommend the culture map, which goes back to what we were talking about before, but how do different cultures interact? How do they work together? What does the EI look like in different cultures? I also think the marketing team read that before with Lauren. So love it. Love how at Power to Fly were so aligned. I would also say Race, Work, and Leadership is another good book. It's a little bit of a thicker one, but it talks a lot about the history behind it. And one, I'm going to add in another one. One that I really love is actually called We Should All Be Millionaires by Rachel Rogers. And She's amazing. And it really focuses on why economic empowerment is so important, right? So when we think about DEI and equality, et cetera, also thinking about how does money play into it and how when there's more economic equality with races, with genders, et cetera, we're able to actually level up the playing field. And the last one is What If. And so What If is a really good book to read that talks a little bit more about the storytelling, the scenarios around DEI and give some really great examples to help kind of vision things out. And the last thing that I would say, because I know that we're getting short on time, the last thing that I would say is like, use Instagram as a tool, which use Instagram, but like fact checked Instagram. And I think that that's really important because sometimes it's like, well, I don't know if I want to pick up a book. I don't know why that was like, I don't know if I want to pick up a book. I don't know if I have time to organize my feed lead to find new articles, et cetera. If you spend a lot of your time on Instagram, look for well-known resources, right? So for example, so.informed is a really great resource that's research driven and talks about a lot of different DEI um, topics. So those are some ways that you can start off. Hopefully that helped. And Arushi, I'll pass it back over to you. No, it is a sort of like a moment like that when you're talking about books. It does feel like, oh my God, I have to read a book. But Books are so accessible these days, audibles, podcasts, your own podcast, right? So we can always sort of go ahead and if we if we have to make time for it, we will make time for it. I think that's just an excuse that humans do come up with, but that's some really good resources. And I think uh, our, our notes are being written down by our audience members and by me too. So I need to certainly go and research these books also. But, you know, coming back to talking about DEI, I, is it, is it a misconception or, you know, what is it? Is DEI only reserved for, you know, the BIPOC community or people of color or can anyone participate in DEI? You know, this is a, <laughs> this is also a burning topic that a lot of people I'm sure ask you this. Oh, this is such a great question. And this is something that I think is so important. So, and this also goes into like the global aspect of it as well. It was really interesting. I'll give a quick story, but one of my friends sent me this master's program here in Spain that was talking about DEI and organizations, et cetera. I was looking down the list of the speakers and they all happened to be older Spanish, Hispanic individuals. So there was nothing that talked about racial diversity. There was nothing that talked about cross-cultural diversity, et cetera. And so for me, I was like, oh, there's a gap that's missing here, right? But in Spain, when you think about the top five diversity factors, race and ethnicity isn't even on there, right? Because in Spain, it looks a little bit different, literally and metaphorically. But I think something that's so interesting to think about is, again, when we're talking about the definition of DEI, it's not just for BIPOC or people of color, but thinking about DEI in regards to the LGBTQIA plus community, in regards to the veterans community, in regards to neurodiversity, et cetera. One thing that I do think is really important is being able to understand marginalized experiences, right? So whether those are lived experiences or experiences that, that you bring in other thought experts for, I think something that we would be remiss to talk about is what does it also feel like, what does it look like to have lived experience and being able to communicate that, right? And so I think that when we are thinking about practicing DEI, being DEI champions, et cetera, it's not for the BIPOC 
or the POC community, but also like allies, like allies are maybe one of the most important resources that we have and not just having allies, but active, active allies, right? So being active in your allyship, also being able to create space and give space to voices that matter. And also something that I think is so important is representation of different individuals and realizing that there's a saying, but it's like, you can't be what you can't see, right? And so just saying, how are all individuals and companies being able to say, hey, there's someone who not just looks like me, but sounds like me or can relate to my experience or maybe comes from a similar socioeconomic status, et cetera. So definitely not just for the BIPOC community, but I do think something that's really important is being able to either speak for, be an ally for, or bring in voices that have had lived experiences as a marginalized individual, whatever that might be. Again, coming back to connecting those dots, if I'm able to see my leader be someone like me, I want, I can be them, right? I have the opportunity to be them. Very well put. So, you know, coming back to intention, you've spoken about intention so much. You've spoken about DEI being intentional in that whole form. You know, I would love to focus the last two, three minutes on you, your podcast leading with intention. I basically binged your podcast this weekend. <laughs> so I did my chores and listened to you all weekend. You spoke, spoke a lot about intention. What can we learn from your podcast? And, you know, if someone were to connect with you, is that a good place to start? Uh, thank you, Arishin. You have me excited to get back on the podcast wagon. So yeah, I have a podcast called Leading with Intention and like, I know we have two minutes left, but I just want to define intention for us because I think we don't lean into definitions enough, right? Intention is a thing intended, an aim or a plan, but also in the medical world, it means the healing process of a wound. Mm -hmm. And for me, like I get chills every time I think about it because it's like, how are we healing what we think leadership is supposed to look like, sound like, be, et cetera. And instead saying, how can we be anomalies and like, regain our sense of power when it comes to leadership by showing up who we truly are. So the podcast, I talk a lot about helping women build careers that are aligned with their lifestyle so they can do what they love and then also take back control of their time and energy. Because for me, that's how we beat the system. That's how we're able to live free, fulfilling lives. And so talk about career growth, personal alignment, leadership, lifestyle design, et cetera. But I really just want to encourage all of you, definitely check out the podcast. It's on all places that you can listen to podcasts, but also thinking about what would your life look like if you stopped playing small and started stepping into the person that you know you're meant to be or creating a life that's even bigger than that, doing that through your work, through your personal life and finding that alignment and intention. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sienna. Is it okay if people reach out to you on LinkedIn? There are a few questions that maybe people have from the audience. Can they follow up with you? Is that okay? Um, Absolutely. I, right, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Rishi. It was an honor. And also thank you to all of you for listening, engaging in the chat, and we'll be watching this recording afterwards. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sienna. It's been an absolute pleasure. Meg, over to you. Thank you. Thank you both. This was absolutely wonderful. I love listening to Sienna talk about these, these um, subjects just because there, there's a lot of really great reasons why Sienna is our global director. And listening to her will like listening to her for two minutes will absolutely like show you why. Um, so I'm, I'm so, so happy to get to work with both of you. And this, this was a great conversation. So thank you.